Hello. So we've got Paul Marks here, who is the head Olympic coach of the Snowboard Germany, Alpine Snowboard. Hi, Paul. Hi, great to see you. It's uh, it's cool that we can use some sort of uh, this kind of platform to actually uh, catch up. For sure. So, um, Paul, I actually don't know the details of your personal story as an athlete. You know, now you're heavily involved as a coach, but how did it all start with you? How did you end up in the professional sport? Uh, so my path, especially to snowboarding, is quite a bit different as I didn't come up as a snowboarder. I was uh, very involved in, in ski racing as a child, which I also started quite late as a going into actual competitive ski racing. I've always been a skier growing up. I always wanted to be a ski racer. And I grew up just outside of Vancouver with luckily with parents that were very motivated to take me skiing. I spent a lot of time in Whistler and then in Cyprus, Hemlock, all the local mountains around Vancouver. And then uh, moving into the interior up at some peaks where I joined uh, as far as my first team in some peaks Al Alpine race club, where I really got into uh, more of a higher level of ski racing and more full time where I ended up actually moving away from home at 15 to live with a family or to a billet and to do a lot of school offline and really try to see what, what I can do with ski racing and with my abilities at that time. And then up until 19, being with some peaks and uh, interior ski racing, uh, just trying to see how far I can go. I took it uh, one year after high school and really committed for, for a couple of years. Uh, to say I was uh, the top level as far as competition wise, competing at sort of NORAMs and being at that level, but not quite being having what it takes to really make it to that, uh, that next step. And that was sort of pretty clear to me at, uh, at 19 that it wasn't going to be that, uh, that, really, that dream to, to really go that far. But my desire to keep skiing was always there. Like I wasn't going to quit ski racing and, and just drop out of the skiing community or like the winter sports community. So I, I made that decision. And then uh, I jumped straight into coaching at that time. With, our, uh, with the club where I at some peaks and went to university at uh, Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops. And I would say even then that my, my passion for skiing was even stronger at that point where I started. As soon as I quit ski racing, I was like, okay, how can I spend even more time on snow, which is probably different than a sort of an athlete that quits at, a, at a, a later stage of their career. It's like, okay, I'm done with this. I don't want to do this anymore. Like spend a couple of years off skis or off snowboard and be done with it a bit, but I was, I knew I didn't have quite then what it, what it took, but I knew that I needed to do more and I wanted to stay involved in high, high, uh, comp, high level sport. At that point of being uh, young and single, sort of <laughs> taking a train <laughs> and just cruising around Europe for, for, for a summer was a, was a really cool experience. And through that and jumping on with the, the Canadian snowboard team at that time, especially Mark Ballard and, and his program, uh, where he invited me to come out and, and do some work for him, where he took the, the trust and, the, and sort of seeing my abilities to sort of say, hey, I know you're from skiing, but uh, maybe you can come help us out, help us out with on the tuning side, and then also jumping in to do a bit more coaching, sort of take for him, taking the, also been the jump to be like, okay, we can, maybe an outside perspective could also be good for the team. And that's sort of how it all started as far as the, on the, on the snowboard side of things. And that's slowly built up year after year, every year. I mean, the first year was just doing contract work between sort of my, sort of my ski job jobs and do a, I spend a week in France working for a British ski team and then jump over to Germany to help Mark Ballard and uh, the Canadian snowboarders out and then switch back to a club I was working for in Norway at that time. And then each year it built up to be more and more and more. And then leading up after sort of 2012 and 2013, then it was full time. And then 2014 going into Sochi uh, with the, the, my first Olympics with the, with the Canadian team. And then was uh, full on board and, a, and really a, a cool experience and to jump on that with that team as it was a big push for an Olympic medal, especially after the success of 2010. 
So with, with you, you've seen a few athletes retire from the German team. Um, do you stay in touch with them? Uh, yeah, I think, um, I mean, that's, to be, to be honest, retirement as a coach is, is some of the, one of the hardest, for me personally, one of the hardest things to deal with. And, I've, and it's, a, it's a tough subject for me now too, because I, I just had two of my top athletes retire after last season. And it's sort of, it's a struggle because at the same time as the coach and especially running a program, especially if you have athletes quitting at, at sort of the top of their career. I mean, my job is to win Olympic medals and to get results. So the part of me is sort of devastating to lose sort of to your top athletes because on paper, then you know that, you have, I mean, you're always trying to build up your next group, but you want to keep on your, your, your top team as long as you can and, and keep those results going. And the other side, it's also, you build up those bonds, those friendships. And it's also cool to see that they move into their next part of their career or when they, I think Selena just announced, Selena York, one of our, our oh, she did. Uh, the world champion from last year, she announced that she's pregnant and to see oh, them move into that wow. kind of, yeah, yeah. To move them into that step, next step of their career and or life, life really is, uh, is uh, pretty also pretty cool to see. I think it's tough because you you always say. I mean, it's also like you always tell your high school friends that you're going to stay in touch and be friends forever. And uh, I I do see that's the thing. The difference in an athlete quitting later in their career. A lot of a lot of them in them. I mean, it's too early to say for Selena or for Cheyenne, but I think a lot of them want to take a bit of a bigger step away from the sport for a while because that was all they were doing for such a long time and it was everything that they know about themselves and I think a lot of them enjoy moving into that next stage and, and seeing something new about themselves so that's where I think that we lose a bit of contact there because I, I don't want to keep pushing snowboard stuff onto them and um, I think uh, I respect that you anyone wants to take uh, that that step away especially quitting when you're your like twenties or into your thirties and where you've literally been doing that same thing for the last over 15 years, I think for Selena probably, or when you have Anka or I'm, I'm, they've been going to that. We just come back from Switzerland last week and we've been doing that, that Switzerland camp for longer than I've been coaching for the German team. And I've, I've been for, for, all, for almost eight for seven years now, but before that Selena was still on the team. So they've been going to that like August, just, okay, August, the season starts, we go to Switzerland and they go to that same hotel. I think for them to finally break, break out of that and then to do something different and to have a proper summer and to not have that con conditioning training, to think every day to get that, that, that last result. I mean, of course they need to think like that for their, their, their next career, but to think differently for once is, uh, I think a special thing, special thing too. Right. You know, you mentioned that athletes, when they are having their sports career for so long, it's all they know about themselves. And they find talking with athletes and coaches that that at first, yes, you take a break and you enjoy your life outside that sports world for a year or two, but then the self-identity crisis creeps in and then you find yourself that yes you've come out of the sport you've made that big step but what's next you know especially when you're um, at a high level you know what you're capable of and then a lot of athletes find that they have to start something all over again or they need to return to the sport where they know how the system works um what to expect you know what what are are the steps um how many have you seen that would transition smoothly or on the other hand uh, have a very long transition um you would probably agree that in north america they probably have a longer transition because of the backup system that uh we don't necessarily have here but the um, european countries do I think as far as the European or the German side, the most or all of the athletes that have retired from the German team in my time there have all transitioned pretty smoothly into their next step of their careers. But a lot of that has been with help. Either they, they're still with the police in some sort of form or another, or 
with the army, for example, they have a lot of university opportunities. They have a lot of studying opportunities. So some of them went straight into studying as soon as they, as they retired. And I, I would love if all of them came and worked as coaches, <laughs> that would be, that would be a dream to have because uh, to have more people come back. But I think, as I said, since we've had such athletes such a long time that most of them haven't made that tr transition back into sport or to, not sport. I mean, all of them are still very involved in sport and still go snowboarding or skiing or in, in some way or, or another, but most of them have transitioned perfectly into a career, but not direct as far as, okay, I'm going to go back and world cup and be a world cup coach or put that time commitment or time away from home. I think a lot of them or pretty much most of them all have fairly normal jobs where they can spend more time at home and, and enjoy that, that more family time, friends time and stuff that they've been missing out for so many years. Yeah. You know, um, talking with athletes and what's the main struggle for them when they retire is generally that um, in snowboarding, we would have races every weekend. So, to, well, on average, right, um, when we would have the heat of the season. For a lot of athletes, it would be at least every two weeks, uh, every three weeks. So you get that rush and you get that adrenaline and you get the excitement pretty much on a regular basis. And then when you retire from sports, you're missing that excitement of life and competition and achievement and uh, having the goal in front of you and having a direction because you're um, getting ready for a specific tournament or you're getting uh, ready for a specific race. And then outside of sports, people start looking for things that are going to excite them just as much as the sports did. And few of them get to find it. And what a lot of people also find that some athletes, they're making good money during their active athlete's career. And then when they retire, they start going through all that money to be able to keep up with the excitement of life, not really knowing what's going to give them the next hit of the excitement. Yeah, I mean, I would hope then they would find jobs that would uh, that keep that excitement going. Like I, I didn't leave to a far enough away but i managed to keep that excitement going as a coach for sure and i mean i, I don't know as far as outside looking in on, on your social media it seems like as far as your work stuff which is very far away from snowboarding but it looks like you you look for I mean, you don't have like a, a proper nine to five job so you no, have I... to build you have to work and then when you do hit that high level or you get that contract or you get that I mean, that must be a, a similar feeling in a way, or I'd like to think from it. It's, it's like, I haven't, I haven't, and that's how it works for me as a coach, as far as not even just with the, the results or just trying to build the program and getting that next level, that that gets that at least a little bit of that adrenaline rush for sure. It's not maybe at that same, that level, but that would be my hope for, for every athlete that, that quits, that they at least move themselves into a career or at least have the passion, I think, as long as you have a passion for your job, it doesn't need to be snowboarding. It can be in, in, in anything. You can still be working a nine to five, but if you have that passion for the job to at least get that, get that goal, get that sale, then at least that's something that can have, have that, that little bit of that feeling. But if you don't find that, then I, for sure, it would be very, very tough to, to keep going. But I, I think that's the one thing that from a lot of athletes at least get to that Olympic level, at least, that the highest level that don't get knocked out too early, that they're great uh, employees or not just employees or the great people to start their own businesses or to, because they've been through those struggles and pushes and they, they want to have that, that adrenaline rush that, I mean, if I was in a, had, had a business or anything that where I am positioned to hire people, except for obviously if I could hire ex Olympians as coaches, then, <clears throat> which we, we do, which I do have on my team, which is excellent, that those are the people I want to have around because sure. they generally do have that fire and that uh, makes something a little bit different than, uh, than your, your average person. So uh, I would say that for anyone to, to be able to take, I mean, that's the one thing maybe that is that thing on the resume in Canada, being, having, uh, being an Olympian has it a, bit, a little bit extra worth that I would hope that it would... <clears throat> If you have an Olympian on your resume, 
that a lot of companies would be like, okay, maybe he doesn't have that study time or <clears throat> this exact qualification that we need, but that's an Olympian. That's someone that's worked hard. That's, that's put that effort in that's, that struggled and knows the struggle and they want to have results. They don't want to just come in and just be average. They want to be the best, I think in any position. If you were to mentor someone to retire, you know, and plan it, what would you say, how do you plan your retirement from the sport in your opinion? Oh, difficult. Um, like it's, it's different for me because I, I tried, I mean, as a, as a coach you, or working for a federation, you're, you're trying to ex extract the best out of that athlete for as long as possible. If the system works well, you've got new ones coming up, new athletes coming up, and then you can just, you can keep the train rolling. Obviously as a smaller sport, I mean, I'm very fortunate to have some top athletes still in the system. But to leave at your best is something, if you're in a position to do that, I mean, that's, this, is, this is my own just personal opinion, not, I mean, as far as a coach, I'd like to keep, as long as that athlete can have that results and get stay on the podium for as many races as possible, then as a, a coach, someone working for, and I mean, I, I work for a system that's paid for results. I, I'm paid to have to get the athletes to Olympics and where we need to get to bring Olympic medals home. We need to bring world cup home. That's, that's my job. So on the paper side of things, I need as long as more people I can get, bring those results back the better. And I need to keep that going. But on a personal side to, to step away at the top seems pretty cool. I mean, that's, that's something that Selena York was able to do now. Um, and to, to go a year before the Olympics as world champion, double world champion to be like, no, that's not. And someone she didn't want to, to do another summer of that hard work. She, I think you, you know, every time the season's over that the next, as soon as you finish that last race, maybe you do a little holiday, but then it starts all over again. And you kind of, you, you don't just go from here to here. You need to take another step back and then you build up to get back to that next level. And that's exhausting and but to know i mean i mean first you have to win everything to be able to leave at that top level but that's how i would definitely say to someone if you've made it and you've set yourself up and you've got a good career plan for after then that's definitely a very good option to be able to as far as being still in the media spotlight and having that uh, respect i know from some other athletes they just want to do it as for as long as they can but you definitely see a difference in someone that's quit when they were the best compared to someone who was the best and then left at a later point in their career, you don't, you don't get, you don't leave as being told you're the best. Right. And so but how I think, much, I'm sorry, go on. But I think also, I mean, that, that side of things, leaving at your best is also, I mean, you, it's pretty much comes down to if you're ready to quit and you have the plan or maybe you don't even have a plan, to only retire and only leave when you want to. Right. If you have that opportunity, sure, some athletes are told to leave and don't have the opportunity. But even then, I help those athletes find another way because there's always another way to continue if, or I mean, there's depends on where you're from that obviously makes a big difference and what your financial options are. But if you have an opportunity to, to go another path, you see that a lot in skiing, people join private teams and a lot of them don't make it any after that anyway. But at least then they maybe still have that, that year of closure to be like, okay, I wasn't on the national team anyway, I went a private route. But to really retire on your terms, even if you do get cut, then try another way and then tell you're ready to say, no, I, that's it, I'm done. What would you think uh, made the transition well where you have a hardworking athlete who knows how to be determined and work well in the environment that's high pressured but is scared of choosing a new direction because of the fear that it's not going to be as fulfilling as sport. And for me, a big change what I'm starting to do and I'm trying to learn how to also do this better is to give the athletes more, especially the older athletes in, the, in their careers, is to get them making more decisions at the end of their careers into their programs, into what they're, they're doing as far as the travel. I, I, I as a coach, 
I really try to keep the team in a bubble and I try to keep everything organized and try to keep everything that's travel related and try to keep all those, any problems on as onto me and uh, don't get to let those issues onto the athletes. But at the same time, I'm trying to be better and to let them, and you, you obviously have to at that, at the higher level, but to get them to making more decisions into their, into that next step. Obviously I have, can give my opinions and recommendations, but instead of being too much of it, uh, there's a lot of coaches that are a bit more authority and say, well, we're doing this, this, and this. I'm trying to be more, to let them make more decisions in, into their, in, into the next step and where we're going and how, what's the best way to get things going. And I think that, I think if you're too much trying to be the mother or father or trying to just organize everything, then you do have more issues then when they, when it is over, then it's like, okay, shit, what do I, what do I do now? But yeah, uh, totally. I think if I hope that's a good way for a lot of coaches and at least to let the athlete to be a bit more involved in that. And you see a lot of athletes that do maybe their own thing privately. I think they have a bit of easier transition because organizing uh, as winter snowboard season is uh, it's a huge nightmare to try to financially figure out how you're going to do it. So obviously you're not giving all that stress, especially I'm not putting all that stress on my athletes, but trying to make more decisions and what's the best way forward and what's the best way for the program to get them a bit more involved. And I think that helps that uh, hopefully they, they, they don't, and I don't think any of mine have been walked away without not knowing how to, to function in life because right. I've booked every hotel room for them, but they're not having to book hotel rooms, but uh, at least it, it's a, a one-on-one, co- a, a back and forth conversation. Great. Well, I, I think we've discussed some really hot topics that are generally not discussed and people don't even know about them or you know they don't even identify it i find that uh somewhere internally uh coaches or athletes they feel it but they don't know how to actualize it or how to put it in words how they feel or what they think it's somewhere in the background but nobody really um puts it into wording that's comprehensive for the brain, for the mind. I I think uh, the information that you provided today is very valuable, especially from the coach's perspective, what you can notice in an athlete, what the athlete doesn't see herself or himself. I think it's very valuable. And I think when people are going to listen to it or watch this video, they're going to ask a few questions uh, for themselves and find answers that they might have been looking for, but not necessarily knew where to go or who to ask. Yeah, for sure. It was definitely uh, great, to, great to talk to you, and especially to see f- former, weren't, weren't ever one of my athletes, but to see uh, ex athletes uh, exceeding and uh, doing well with their careers and, and doing well with life and having families. It's uh, it's always great to see.